Welcome to a show about shows, about games. Old shows about old gamers, because this channel does old things. Intros! I'm great at them! Games and the rest of the UK media world have an odd relationship. Mainstream media may allow games to sit alongside film and literature in their culture sections, but is just as keen to act like an outsider, ready to put the virtual boot in on topics like the epilepsy scandal of the early 1990s, or the violent video games controversy which hit its peak in the late 90s and still returns every so often for a valedictory tour, particularly when there are complex societal issues to ignore in favour of blaming things on games and or heavy metal music. TV in particular has a rather strained relationship with games, perhaps because it doesn't want to remind viewers of other things they could be doing with that very same screen they're watching right now, which it handles largely by ignoring the existence of games entirely, unless games have done something wrong that week. Despite the huge potential audience, even award-winning creators such as Charlie Brooker have lamented the difficulty of getting shows about games commissioned. And even in the rare occasions they are, shows are typically shunted to unsociable times, some distant secondary channel several pages down the set-top box menu, or an on-demand service only. And yet in the early 90s, with games a much smaller market and much less embedded in our everyday culture than they are now, we had not one, but two primetime gaming shows on proper channels with single-digit numbers, each of them renewed for multiple series. But this does make sense. Even though the world of games was much less mainstream then, and confined largely to children and teenagers, games just weren't competing with TV in the same way. You were expected to grow out of them, cast them aside in favour of football, puffy jackets, and drinking cheap cider in the doorway of Woolworths before settling into a comfortable middle age where you'd spend your evenings watching reruns of Open All Hours and Dad's Army without ever thinking, actually, I'd rather spend the next four hours pretending to drive across Colorado in a big truck. So TV didn't feel threatened by games in the same way, and even if it had, the 90s was still an era in which producers were told to just go away and make some television, and it wasn't really interfered with past that point which meant gaming shows were a thing, and thus there was one vitally important question to ask in the playground circa 1993. Were your Games Master household, or a bad influence one? Well, uh, it wasn't a big thing, it was quite possible to watch both of them, and admitting you liked games in our playground was a fast route to getting yourself bundled and or sprayed with a can of Lynx for enjoying something so childish and nerdy. This really was just a badly thought out narrative device for me introducing that there were two shows, but most of the people I talked to predominantly watched just one of them. I was a bad influence kid. To the wide eyes of an 11 year old, it was far more accessible than the laddish assault which was Games Master. They looked at stuff and had features rather than endless challenges, and most importantly, were prepared to acknowledge the existence of the PC as a thing you could play games on. Rather important for me. Also, the small but important detail that Games Master was broadcast at 6.30pm, and I only had use of our lone household TV until 5.35, at which point everyone else would get home and want to watch Neighbours. Bad Influence was driven by two presenters, Andy Crane, a veteran of children's TV who had hosted the BBC's famous broom cupboard and sort of bumbled his way through Bad Influence in good-natured fashion with what appeared to be the firm belief that enthusiasm would make up for seemingly not having the slightest clue about the subject matter. And he mostly did get away with it. It was certainly watchable. Meanwhile, Violet Berlin was the hip games expert who went to game studios, got involved with exciting 90s technology like motion capture, virtual reality, and a bizarrely large number of things centred around silicon graphics computers and was notably immortalised as a character in Micro Machines 2, which the show showed the process of. Stage one. <laughs> Take some funky reference photographs of our Violet. Stage two. Oh, do keep up, Violet. Turn it over. There we are. Preliminary sketches to create the caricature. This was one of my personal favourites. Sadly, it didn't make it into the game. Stage three. They develop the caricature to a satisfactory stage, i.e. give it lots and lots of hair up the top here. And stage four. 
<coughs> finalize the caricature and transfer to computer to create the animation frames. Apparently, as a part of this, she asked to be made the fastest character. A request only partially granted, as Violet in Micro Machines 2 is the second fastest character in the game. The first free series featured reports from Z Wright, who would rove around the United States looking at the latest technology. At the time, these pieces felt like missives from a distant future. For much of the 80s and 90s, the US felt like it was perennially about 10 years ahead of rainy old Britain, a world where everything was bigger, better, and most likely needed to be experienced through 3D glasses. It is a bit harder to watch these segments in a time when this is no longer new technology and comes across a bit like someone wandering around a 1970s kitchen, being incredibly excited by a bin with an openable flap. Another bad influence fixture were reviews given by children, which mostly served to highlight why professional games journalism exists. But still, I'm sure many viewers imagined, as I did, being on that screen, explaining that Here you have to roar at the monkeys so they turn round and throw you in the opposite direction over the river. And also having all their savage comments ignored by the producer, as a game which was clearly rubbish and nobody enjoyed got scored four by the girls and five by the boys as it happened to be that week's prize. This reached a peak with Series 3, one which so hotly anticipated Rise of the Robots in the wake of a breathless making of preview from the end of Series 2 that the show's original dinosaur-centric motif was replaced with a 3D-rendered robot-themed design full of metallic clanks and, I don't know, probably some sort of welding sound. This caused a slight problem when the hotly anticipated game, the one Bad Influence had spent episode after episode telling us how brilliant and Jurassic it would be, turned out to be as disappointing to play as finding out that the promised soundtrack by Brian May out of that there Queen turned out to be, on most platforms, a crunchy 8-bit sample of a single chord. You got more Brian on an advert for the Fork Granada. And yet even this skullduggery seems mild compared to the first series repeatedly pretending that a Watara Supervision, or Quickshot Supervision as it was in the UK, was an amazing prize, on par with getting a Mega Drive or SNES with even a mediocre game, and not a cheap sub Game Boy portable with an even worse screen. Oh, someone's going to defend the Supervision, aren't they? I'm going to spend the rest of my life signing into YouTube Studio to cast withering looks at the endless outpourings of the Watara Supervision is the best fourth generation console, and we won't hear. Anything else, club? Now speaking of tedious things to endure, being a child at the time and a lover of hopelessly immature comedy, which sadly continues to this day, my favourite of the segments was Nam Rude, a shed and basement dwelling techno terrorist played by Andy Ware, who would perform short skits, call us all fertilers for some reason, and give away the most obvious cheat codes for two year old games, which even people who didn't play games could recite from memory, by gluing them to his forehead. The 90s, it was a time, okay? Now sometimes the producers wouldn't even bother with this low level of attainability and just make up games to provide cheats for as a sort of in-joke. Well, I still found the skits funny. Hello Furtlers, Nam Wolf here. I've been thinking about tunnels, because you know what? They're really, really boring. They take hours and hours to drive through. So I've invented this. It's the NAM Industries Super Tunnel. Watch this. Look at that. Through in seconds. It's going to revolutionise hills, mountains, roads and railways. And if you're building roads and railways in Transport Tycoon, here's a cheap view that will give you infinite money. In early versions of the game, just go over to the edge of the map and build a really long tunnel and the game will give you millions. In early series, the show would finish with an item called the Data Blast, in which pages of text would flash at high speed with the intention you recorded them and viewed them at leisure on your VCR. 
assuming you had one of the fancy ones with the jog dial, which would let you creep through with frame by frame precision. We did not have one of those, we weren't even allowed to use the pause button on our astonishingly temperamental Amstrad VHS deck, under a strict parental warning that it would knacker up the heads. Bad Influence finished in the overall sense after four series, the fourth of which was a retool, dropping Nam and Z, moving Violet to features only, and bringing Sonia Saul into the studio as co-host. Unfortunately, the idea tank seemed to have run a bit low by this point, with several features from earlier series repeated, maybe with slightly different software if you were lucky, and not even necessarily the good features. How many times do we need to plan a fashion show? Then there was Games Master. Well, there was if your family wasn't watching the news at 6.30 because they seemed bizarrely interested in whatever Michael Heseltine was up to that week, such as listing his favourite cheeses, or purchasing some sort of motorised revolving tie rack for the purposes of optimising his tie selection. I, I, I really didn't pay much attention to the news. It seems I'm an outlier in this, the Games Master thing, not the not paying attention to the news thing, because when I descended deep into the global retro gaming YouTube conspiracy to ask my local Illuminati chapter, uh, I mean, when I asked a bunch of other channels I coincidentally know, which show they remembered, the answer was almost always Games Master. That was the one they watched, the one they loved, the one where they even went to the live event and came home with a handful of stickers. Oh, hi there. As a matter of fact, I did go to Games Master Live. Uh, this was in, I think, 1992 was when the show was, like December, I think, from what I've read. I think it went on a Saturday, and it was at Birmingham at the NEC, so it was just like a really big concrete room full of lots of people. And it was a really big concrete room, I remember, because they had the Sonic 2 bus there, and I played Sonic 2 on a bus, that was cool. And then I think I sat on a motorbike, like a full motorbike, and it had like Road Rash built into it. I think Road Rash 1, I guess it's not Road Rash 2. Um, and just lots of people. I think I might have seen Dominic Diamond, but it was like on a stage it was hard to see. Might have seen Jazz Rignall handing out copies of Mean Machines magazine, Mean Machines Sega at that point. Who knows, I can't remember. Um, so yeah, I remember it being a good day, played lots of video games. Went down with some of my pals from school because 92, we're talking, it's got to be Peak Games Master, right? It's got to be, like, when it was, like, with all the kids, it was like, oh, wow, Games Master is so cool. Um, and I picked up a lot of stickers. And I mean a lot of stickers, like, sheets of stickers of, like, uh, I think mainly Virgin Games. Like Amanda Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing might have been one. Was there a Mahamad? No, Muhammad Ali one. That was the one I had stickers of. And they all kind of went, I had a shelf, like above the head of my bed, so they all went underneath there. So for the next, I don't know, 10 years, I woke up every morning and looked up to see stickers for Muhammad Ali's boxing game and Sonic 2 stickers and similar stickers that I can no longer remember. Um, so yeah, it was good. Games Master Life. Can't remember it at all because it was 20 years ago. Phil, you might have the stickers, but if either of us end up in a life or death situation which can only be resolved with knowledge of the precise movements of Michael Heseltine, 1992 to 1996, we know which way that one's going. Badly for both of us, because, like I said, I really didn't pay attention to the news. They could have been sending cows into space and all sorts, and all I'd have been thinking is, how much more of this do I have to endure before I can sneak upstairs and play Transport Tycoon? Despite the protestations of its crew that they were absolutely not aiming for this, Games Master was much more self-consciously cool and arch, with fake-out openings to pretending to be technical difficulties in Series 2, and contrived sets intended to represent oil rigs power stations, and even the astral planes. Somehow they had convinced notable xylophone-playing astronomer Patrick Moore to be the Games Master, a deliberately calm and intellectual foil to the energy of Dominic Diamond on the floor. The core of Games Master was challenges, where 
kids, or possibly a celebrity, would enter the studio and compete on popular console games of the day to win a golden joystick. If a head-to-head -head or solo against the game in things which now look like early precursors to the speedrunning community. Don't at me on that. Some celebrities were unsurprisingly rather poor at the games. However, even with someone competent holding the controller, the competition wasn't always fair, with some sequences being reshot multiple times until the producers got a result which made good television, rather than necessarily showing the best gamer winning. While I might have enjoyed this challenge-focused approach less than features in which silicon graphics computers rendered things and people somehow made lasers boring, it did give Games Master a core format which didn't need a constant stream of new ideas to stay fresh and interesting, helping it last much longer. Indeed, for seven series between 1992 to 1998, and the majority of those were long, with 18 or even 26 episodes broadcast. Another repeatable element in the Games Master format was reviews, a segment which it shared with bad influence, although this time the reviews were by games industry professionals and not children. Until the fifth series, where the presenters did it. However, you may spot at times that some of them hadn't always had a chance to play the games they were talking about, having to make up some plausible sounding and professional statement on the spot. I'd not like we ever noted. They were, after all, up against kids who'd spend an hour playing a beat em up, only to offer such insightful gems as I don't like violent video games. Games Master, it turned out, did like violent video games. So you know what I was saying about producers mostly being left alone to do their own thing? The final show of Games Master Series 4, which would in theory go out at 6.30pm, prime family viewing time well before any watershed, was a gore special, featuring challenges from Mortal Kombat and running around Doom using the chainsaw, violent game mods, and graphic inserts all over the place. After emergency meetings with some quite senior people at Channel 4, it did not go out at 6.30pm. It went out at midnight. If only I'd had a TV in my room, then I'd have watched the hell out of that. They also had viewer competitions. No matter what the show, I was never allowed to enter any of these, being told the refrain familiar to children everywhere. You can't enter. Nobody ever wins these things, they're all just a scam to get your details, and the prize probably doesn't even exist. Well, I mean, all those parents were right, weren't they? Nobody ever won anything off Bad Influence or Games Master, not even so much as a quickshot supervision. Being an old man, I was firmly into adulthood by the time Games Master slipped onto my TV. As an avid gamer, and at the time of Series 5, Episode 14, a rabid PlayStation owner, a show aimed squarely at my demographic and entertainment tastes was a complete no-brainer. The highlight of the episode was watching Bianca and Robbie from EastEnders install a game on a PC, which stuck in my mind for a very particular reason. Competition time. I felt I knew Mr Diamond well enough that chancing my arm on a telephone competition to name his favourite game was worth the 39 pence call. I never expected to win though. I mean, nobody wins these things, do they? A few days later, I happened to answer the cordless telephone and took a bizarre call. Hello, it's Games Master off the TV here. You won a prize in our competition. I don't remember if I had a choice between the two prizes on offer, which were a PlayStation with some games I already owned, or a Sega Saturn with Virtua Fighter 2, Sega Rally, and Virtua Cop with the gun. Whatever the criteria, a few weeks later a box arrived with a Sega Saturn and all the extras. Upon setting up the Saturn next to my PlayStation, the only fly in the ointment was my wife's first question. Which one are you going to sell then? She took quite some convincing, but I hung on to both of them and for a short while, thanks to Dominic Diamond's love of sensible soccer, for the first time in my life I own two current games consoles. Sega Rally is still one of my all-time favourite games. Well, you just go and destroy the legal framework my childhood was built around, Lee. I could have had a 3DO. Maybe, at 10,000 to 1 odds, or whatever. I would that many people have entered a competition, knowing the potential end result was being a 3D owner? Those could have been good odds. 
Even if you were prevented from trying to win an also-ran console, you could benefit from tips for current games for your current console. These were given out by Patrick Moore in a section called the Consultation Zone, a curiously polite affair in which guests would put on a vintage virtuality headset to ask the disembodied head of Moore for help with their game. I presume they re-embodied him in the makeup department after filming was over, although possibly if it was a busy week it might have been easier to simply attach Moore's head to a helium balloon so he could float home for the evening and float back the next morning, given suitable wind conditions. Behind the scenes there was a certain amount of friction between Dominic Diamond and one of those professional reviewers, bandanaclad Dave Perry, whose game's animal persona promoted him from reviews to being part of the main show, but also made him the heel of the programme, the character everyone loves to hate. Unfortunately, this ended up being the case on the set as well as on the screen, culminating in the infamous moment where joke answers were inserted into a quiz about beat-em-ups, followed by Perry being challenged on a game he'd never played before. A story for which I will leave you in the capable hands of Dudley. Games Master's most infamous personality was Games Animal Dave, not the one who did Aladdin on the Mega Drive, Perry. Dave started doing reviews, progressed to hosting challenges alongside Dominic, and eventually became almost as famous a part of the show as its presenter. This probably contributed to them starting off not close, and eventually drifting so far apart that, given the Earth is round, they were in danger of meeting up again. Dave and Dominic ended up detesting each other, something Dominic generally failed to hide whenever he was hosting with Dave. It probably doesn't help that Dominic genuinely was mates with most of the guests, including journalist Kirk Ewing, who Dave was up against when, for the Christmas 1996 special, the challenges were on the commentators. The final round to decide the win was the Cool Cool Mountain course in the then unreleased in the UK Mario 64. Kirk Ewing lasted 20 seconds before falling to Mario's death. Dave Perry didn't even make that, sliding off at pretty much the first opportunity, and then throwing such an epic grade strop he never appeared on the show again, and didn't play Mario 64 for another 20 years. Um, now you have actually said on the show you are the greatest games player in Britain. What happened? What went wrong? Well, I think I've been set up fairly badly here today. Don't know what the fuss is personally. I did it first time. Now, maybe playing Super Mario is easier for us these days when we are very familiar with analog controllers, and indeed, back when this was shot, the analog controller was strange and unusual, and the spaceship-like N64 controller did take some getting to grips with. I mean, poor old Dave. This wasn't even in his job description. Not a journalist, I'm a marketing manager. Games Master was recently revived by Channel 4, this time with Rab Florence presenting and Sir Trevor MacDonald serving as the somewhat befuddled Games Master. And it is well done, keeping much of the original character of the show while modernising it and allowing the new presenters to bring their own character. It is sadly only a mini-series confined to E4's YouTube channel, but see above my point about games and TV. And they did invite Quang and Asobi Tech to build some of the games for it, so, you know, that's sort of a cool shout-out. But Games Master is not the only 90s gaming institution returning to your screen via the medium of YouTube. If you had a Teletext TV in the 90s, lived in the UK, and were into games, then the name Digitizer should need little introduction. Even if you didn't, you may have stumbled across Chris Bell's Super Page 58 and read the best bits by proxy through the medium of the internet. I will give you one guess which of those categories I fall into. Digitizer was created by Paul Rose and Tim Moore, under the pseudonyms Mr Biffo and Mr Hares, with both writing and Rose creating the graphics as in-house artist. Other credits of his include creating the Boozler family for Teletext Bamboozle Game and writing and drawing the Turn of the Worm comic. It ran for a little over ten years, from 1993 to 2003, first as a double act, then Biffo alone with occasional contributors after Mr Hares left Teletext in 1996. It hit a peak audience of 1.5 million, despite, or perhaps because of, surreal humour and the ongoing battle between its writers and the editors at Teletext, who were sure that something rude was going on, even if they didn't understand. 
exactly what. It even at one point invited viewers to connect up via modem and help provide alternative subtitles for Gamesmaster through a special Diddy page. Although it's lost to history how many of those subtitles ended up being Kevin likes bums and other popular crowdsourced sentiments. These days, Tim Moore is a travel author, and Paul Rose a successful screenwriter, with credits including Sooty, The Four O'Clock Club, Almost Never, and, uh, the... I'd see the dog movie. There was apparently quite some executive meddling, and the small matter of a dog who was only able to do one thing when it came to that last one. In 2014, Mr Biffo decided to bring back the digitizer spirit with Digitizer 2000, a knowingly old-fashioned site full of long-format journalism, games reviews, and the kind of oddball features Teletext-era Digi was notorious for. In 2016, Mr Biffo decided to create an idea which had been in his head for some time. Found footage. Initially a short pilot for that year's block party event, but expanded in 2017 thanks to a successful Kickstarter crowdfunding. Found footage is based on the idea that Mr Biffo found a series of VHS tapes at a car boot sale, but upon watching them discovered a... I won't tell you. It's better you watch and find out. Mr Biffo's found footage was crowdfunded through Kickstarter, which he returned to the following year with another ambitious project, to make a proper gaming show. The kind of thing I've spent this video lamenting that TV doesn't make anymore. Digitizer the Show was a magazine format show which ended up being something quite else, with a level of anarchic breakdown far beyond anything you'd see on Bad Influence or Games Master. Also, a lot more prawns for worrying reasons that we probably shouldn't go into. The High Energy Show was followed by a more relaxed lower key series, initially called Digi Minis, where Biffo invited back some of his co-hosts to look at old toys and games and that. I say relaxed and lower key, but then things like this started happening. What, what is that? Ah! What, what is that? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> what is that? I do, I do can. You nearly set yourself on fire. Right. So what's this first one then? Uh, this is this is crackling balls of fire. So let's let's have a go. Ah. Oh, it looks like a little bomb. Ah! I don't think they're indoor fireworks. <laughs> Jesus Christ! They're not. Are they? They're not indoor fireworks. <laughs> And these, well, they never stopped. They're not so much about video games anymore, which may have rubbed some people up the wrong way, but are still recognisably digitizer with a mixture of oddball characters, surreal humour, and inexplicable adverts for things like ants which make omelettes. I would deconstruct this myself, but who better to tell you how a 30-year-old Teletext gaming magazine can translate to YouTube taste tests than the man himself? I don't know that it does. Uh, that's for other people to say, really. Uh, I guess if it does, then it has the same spirit that the Digitizer had, where we um, go off at weird tangents and the like. Uh, and probably because I'm involved with both and I have the same sort of sensibility and the same sense of humour that I always did, even 30 years ago. But I could be wrong. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it does. I don't know what we're doing on Digitizer on YouTube. We're just doing whatever <laughs> tickles our fancy week by week um, and hope that other people like it too, which is pretty much what we did on Digi back in the day on Teletext. So, uh, yeah. And for those of you who missed old-fashioned gaming magazine shows, there is a second level of Digitizer coming to your screens soon and a live stage show in July for which tickets may still be available. Unless you are watching this at a point where July 2023 is in the past, in which case they are not. Except possibly as memorabilia. But while we can relive Digi and Games Master with modern recreation, what about bad influence? Well, it's out there on YouTube and the Internet Archive in low resolution glory, but that would mean watching all the boring bits, having Nam show you cheats you already know, and listening to things being called Jurassic several times per episode. Or you could watch a snappily edited version, 
15 minutes or so with the best director's commentary that never was. Rose Tinted Spectrum, Raking Bad Influence. Zed is doing something really, really boring this week. Right, it's review time, and this week it's Worms, which, do I even need to say 5 out of 5? It's got to be 5 out of 5, right? They're still releasing the same game to this day, and it still sells. I thought this was going to be another boring Lemmings clone, but I was pleasantly surprised. Worms is one of the most addictive games in years, especially in two-player mode. So so The playing area in the game is different every time. You can give your worms names as well. I've called mine Andy, Sahail, Violet and Sonia, and we're playing against Take This, who are one of the better teams in the game. I love the fact he put himself in the game and the other three worms are the presenters and not, say, any of his actual peers. Fuck those guys. Sohail is a cut above these days. Now, it's hard to get more internet than someone giving the Mystery Science Theatre 3000 treatment to a gaming TV show from three decades ago. But you still have to ask, why? Hi, I'm David from Rose Tinted Spectrum. I was asked by Timberwolf, why create a series which is basically adding commentary to a 30-year-old kids program hardly anyone remembers? And that's a good question, but really all you have to do is just look at my channel in general and you'll see that virtually everything I cover is things that nobody remembers. Uh, these are all things that I grew up with as a kid and my channel is basically going back and looking at these things with a modern eye. Uh, Bad Influence was a children's program that I loved dearly, but I knew going back it would be abject torture. Um, I don't want to put all of that on Andy Crane, but I mean... Fear not, oh Sonia. Fresh-faced young cheat boy is here to solve all your gaming catastrophes. So he's got to shoulder part of the blame. So that's why I do this. I just want to say that the camera's over here. Oh, sorry. Hi, I'm David from Roasting. And most importantly, I should add that it's because it's like watching the show with a hilarious friend alongside who also loved the show back in the day. So while TV might be reluctant to give us more than three episodes at a time of a good old fashioned gaming show like they made in the 90s, Maybe we don't need TV anymore. YouTube is a medium which grew up with gaming, owing much of its popularity to all those people who played Minecraft in front of us, or acted visibly disappointed at old Nintendo games, and is full of great shows. You can even watch it on the same screen you're supposed to use for Only Falls and Horses reruns. Well, unless anyone comes home and wants to switch over to Neighbours, which apparently is also coming back. Ah, oh, I'm glad that's all done, and hopefully I've preempted all the people who will tell me that Nam Rood is doorman back. I didn't call that. Ah! Is I've invented this. It's the Nam industry. Hang on, hang on. Did you introduce yourself? Right. Yeah, you need to introduce yourself. <laughs> This is hard, how did Andy do it?